Episode 53, The Paradox. Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. Welcome to The Paradox. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Larson. Thank you for joining me as we explore the U.S. medical system in a fun and informative format where you can learn about what physicians face through expert analysis. And I'm delighted to bring to you today's expert, Dr. Philip Booth. Dr. Booth is a professor of finance, public policy, and ethics, and the dean of the Faculty of Education and Humanities and Social Sciences at St. Mary's University in Twickenham in the U.K. I had an opportunity to sit down and speak with him at Acton University, where he's a guest lecturer and spoke about the NHS, what it was doing well, what it was not doing well, what we could take from it, and what we should leave behind. For those of you who not had the opportunity to attend, I would highly recommend going to Acton University. It's three days where you not only get lectures in economics and religion, on global development, on social thought, economics, history, literature, but you have an opportunity to sit down and speak with these lecturers and faculty from all over the world. I believe this year there are 95 countries present. Uh, and you get to intermingle with them at most lunches and dinners and breakfasts, in addition to take the same classes that they might be taking with you. The link to that and all the other things we talk about in the show can be found at theparadox.com slash 053. I think you'll really enjoy the discussion with Dr. Philip Booth as we talk about the National Health Service in England, its problems, its successes, and what we can learn about that with our own healthcare system, and how certainly the way the British perceive the U.S. health system as well. He has lots of policy prescriptions, ideas for other things we can do to improve our system here in the United States, and I think there's a lot to be learned there. It's a fairly short discussion, so this episode, and actually the next, which is another one I record at Acton University, will make it a little bit easier for your drive time listening. So without further ado, Dr. Philip Booth and the NHS. Love it or leave it. Enjoy. Well, hello. I'm here with Dr. Philip Booth at the Acton University, and he's been kind enough to stop by and talk to us a little bit about the healthcare system in Great Britain. And he's a professor of finance, public policy, and ethics, and dean of faculty of education, humanities, and social sciences at St. Mary's University, Twickenham, UK's largest Catholic university. He's also a senior academic fellow at the Institute of Economic Affairs, where from 2002 to 16, he was academic and research director. Uh, D Dr. Booth is here today to talk about the NHS, which is commonly known as, I guess, the, the British healthcare system. So thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure. Um, so the first question I have for you, obviously, is the British healthcare system. I've always said on our show that one of the important things to, to recognize is that there's different cultural, there's different cultures within the United, within the world, mm -hmm. and you can't expect to use one sort of uh, system, like the healthcare system, in another country and expect mm -hmm. it to be successful because they're all they have different cultural expectations, yeah. different economies, yeah. etc. Why don't you just go into what the NH is right now as far as like how it works? Yep. Just a basic framework because most of my listeners yeah. are Americans. Okay. Um, I mean, actually, the cultural background um, is quite interesting. So maybe if I do go back to just before the formation Absolutely. of the NHS, that, that's uh, uh, quite crucial. So just before the fa formation of the NHS, in Britain, we had um, a healthcare service, which was pretty much like the healthcare uh, system in most other countries, but possibly somewhat more advanced. So there was um, mixed provision. Local authorities would have hospitals, charities would have hospitals, insurers would have hospitals, and most working people, which uh, at that time would be most working men, uh, would be insured. And there, there was a feeling that there were gaps in the system, particularly for perhaps less well-off dependents of working men. And there are lots of ways that those gaps could have been filled in and we could have gone the same way as the uh, continental models um, so we could have moved to a social insurance system which ensured that everybody got health care provision but through a range of um, competing providers which people would choose for themselves but actually after the second world war we had 
a Labour government which decided to centrally plan uh, or move towards a central planning of large parts of the economy. Okay. So there's a nationalisation of the central bank, of uh, the energy industry, a whole range of other industries, steel, etc., uh, etc., et and this carried on for 30 or 40 years. And it was that government which took the decisions about how to implement the, um, uh, the beverage plan Beveridge was actually a liberal, not, beverage. A, not a socialist. Oh. Beveridge, yes. Yeah, he, so Beveridge was... Um, oh, that's the name uh, of a person. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, okay. <laughs> so Beveridge was commissioned um, during the Second World War to um, uh, write a plan for how to deal with social insurances in various areas, including health, um, uh, after the Second World War. And there would have been various ways of implementing that, but the la- a Labour government, which was really wedded to central planning within the economy, chose to have a totally centrally planned um, healthcare system and in a sense that has set the culture for the last 60 or 70 years it's not that the nhs really grew out of a british culture which demanded that kind of central planning right. it was just that there was a a break after the second world war and one particular labor government was elected which um, decisively moved to centrally plan large parts of the economy and health was included in that in most continental european gov- uh, countries you had a much more mixed system of provision and much even when you got left-wing governments you got much more moderate uh, forms of social democracy than we had in the 45 to 51 period in the united kingdom so it was a, it was a political sort of just a situation happened in england it was just unique that to the continental uh, yeah, yes government um it, yes, it was a set of circumstances that uh, it was probably necessary to have health reform. That health reform happened when we had a government that was very keen on centrally planning the economy. Uh, in continental Europe, um, particularly actually because of church involvement as, uh, in healthcare provision, which was perhaps more deeply embedded, and also church involvement in the development of the post-war uh, political systems in uh, continental Europe, uh, there was... Uh, um, much less of an attachment to central government planning of things and much more of a culture developed in the post-war period of, if you like, partnerships between government, church providers, um, civil society organizations and businesses I in see. providing for health care and other needs. So <clears throat> for, for the rest of the, the kind of you'd say it's like the church was the church was running the, were running the hospitals as a sort of philanthropic, uh, a charity sort of endeavor, like most hospitals began this yep. country as yes. well. Yep. And so that when you had, but it was just different in the in the UK. Yeah, well, it wasn't different before the war, but then it became after different war. after I the see. war. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So in the UK, all the Anglican hospitals were nationalised by the government and became part ah, of I the see. NHS system, as were all the other charitable hospitals and the local authority hospitals. Interestingly, the Catholics fought for and and managed to get an exemption from nationalisation, okay. uh, arguing that health that that charity should be no affair of the state. That was the phrase that was used. Uh, unfortunately, that was only two or three smallish hospitals. Uh-huh. Um, but it it is an interesting exception. Uh, they were probably be, probably given that exception because they were so unimportant. Right, exactly. Yeah. A small percentage of the market yeah. or whatever. Uh, are those hospitals still in operation today? As independent oh, yes, of the they, system, yep, they are. They're, they're still in operation. They're still small and. Um, Unlike in Canada, in the UK, if you want to pay privately, you can do. It's just that you have to pay. Uh, you have to pay twice: once in your, through your taxes for the NHS, and then a second time through private insurance or direct payments. So, so there are um, a small number of private hospitals. Well, actually, quite a large number of small private hospitals in the UK taking patients who are paying privately. Would you describe? So, in this country, you'd say uh, a lot of the the small hospitals they'd almost be small surgical centers and so it's just they just deliver a certain a certain product a certain procedure and that's pretty much what you get there you you, can't, you don't expect full ICU care and maybe the is that similar to that in yeah, the UK yeah so in in a private hospital uh, you wouldn't get accidents and emergency um, they would do relatively simple uh, well actually up to fairly complex surgery depending on the size of the hospital uh-huh. uh, and um, uh, and other things the hospice movement which of course is delivering nursing care rather than medical care is still more or less entirely in a charitable uh, okay. uh, endeavor largely started actually by, by the churches uh, and so then so w- when people are debating in healthcare in the United States I think it's probably not much different here than it is anywhere else in the world that people are not satisfied with the way the healthcare mm-hmm. is delivered because, well, everyone has their problems. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it, I hear people who are from the UK who I talk to physicians who have come here now to, to work because mm-hmm. they say the system back home is terrible or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, you're probably not familiar with Lake Wobegon. 
So you're not familiar with Lake Wobegon? Have you heard? No. So one of the com- one of the storytellers in the U.S. Garrison Keillor would tell a story about this this mythical town in Minnesota called Lake Wobegon. Okay. Very small town, and it was the joke was always all our children are above average, mm-hmm. right? And so many people tend to feel like whatever their institution is, whether it's their school mm-hmm. or their congressman, or mm-hmm. they may think they, they, there's a problem with the, with the schools, mm-hmm. but my school is okay, right? And, yeah. so, mm-hmm. and so when you ask someone, well, what do you think of the NHS yeah. from, from England, they're gonna, if you're from the United States, they're going to say, well, I think it's great. But when they're talking to each other, mm-hmm. the opinion is different, right? Yep. I mean, yes. yep. what, what is a... What is the general... I know there's been some problems with the NHS funding and things like... Can you kind of go into sort of yeah, the problems okay. they're having right now? Okay. So, um, I mean, there have been a large number of problems within the NHS, which have, have uh, uh, o- o- over the years, have, have come into the news headlines. I mean, so, there's been the scandal, for example, of the deaths of a very large number of patients in um, uh, hospital trusts in, in, the, in the Midlands. Okay. Um, and um, I, I, it has to be said that th- this... This was dealt with in a terrible way by the uh, National Health Service's uh, uh, authorities. Um, there are all sorts of problems in, uh, with regard to waiting lists, lack of availability of drug use, and, and this type of thing. Um, but the, the problem is, of course, a, a bit like if you're in the Soviet Union and uh, before the days when food was in uh, scarce supply, right. if you were actually receiving food, you'd think, well, in the absence of the state providing food, I wouldn't have food, right, unless right. you were a farmer. <laughs> um, in in the uh, in the UK, it, it's very common for people to say, "Oh, uh, thank goodness we have the NHS. I had a heart attack and they saved my life." As if had they lived in Germany or Italy or Switzerland, <laughs> right. uh, they would have died. And in actual fact, they would have a bigger probability of dying in the United Kingdom than they would uh, in in those countries. Um, so. Uh, there's a problem that, first of all, people compare the NHS with having no health care sure, at all. Sure, right, yeah. And the second is that when people talk about alternative systems, um, politicians who don't want reform are very quick to throw the American system into the argument as the only alternative system. Now, you can have a, a reasoned debate about whether the U.S. system is better than the U.K. system, and on some measures it will be, on other measures it mm-hmm. won't be, um, but there are a whole range of other healthcare systems out there which are neither the UK system nor the US system from which one could learn. Right. Yeah, and we have and so it is interesting that you have when we have debates about healthcare it's is it you use the, the example of the Canadian system, the Swiss system, the yeah. UK and of course the problem is is that our system is so different to try and transform into any of those no, systems. Sure, yes. yeah. It is and it, I'm sure it's the same with the NHS and to try and compare systems is also very challenging like outcomes or mm-hmm. price yeah. Or, yes. uh, or yep. innovation. Yep. How do you even do those? Things? Okay. Well, I mean, there are lots of comparisons of systems that, that are done. There's a very famous study, which is very often quoted by people who want socialized med- medicine in the U.S., called the Commonwealth Study. Uh, and I shall talk about okay. that in, in, in my lecture. And it ranks the U.K. Um, first by nearly all measures. But then that study is designed by an organization which is promoting um, <laughs> uh, socialized medicine. And, and um, it, it's quite amusing. And was, this was quoted with uh, no sense of irony, actually, one of the British left-leaning newspapers, that the UK health system comes uh, top according to all measures except keeping people alive. <laughs> <laughs> where, where it came next to bottom, <laughs> and, um, and 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 the reason is because most of the measures are designed so that they uh, so they include things such as do systems have co-payments? Well, they don't have co-payments in the UK because uh, everything is paid for by the state. Right. Um, uh, um, how many complaints are there about? Um, Insurers. Well, if there's no insurer, there's no, not going to be any complaints. Right. So this survey is designed to uh, help socialised medicine uh, float to the float to the top. But there are lots of systems in the world. Um, there are different systems have different advantages and disadvantages, uh, um, which are uh, more efficient, allow, um, I think, more the, just the more humane treatment of people. People being treated as people rather than be uh, 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 treated as being on a conveyor belt, mm-hmm. and just allow more choice in terms of uh, what type of healthcare provision people might like. Whether it's a, a religiously inspired form of um, uh, healthcare provision. So in Germany, you can uh, uh, um, the church is a big provider, uh, or maybe some other kind of ethical mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, backdrop to the provision of healthcare in, for another provider. So one of the one of the questions I always get is, uh, I know there's a privacy, as you mentioned earlier, that you can you can get 
go out around the system. In Canada, yeah. you don't often have to have that option yeah. unless you leave the country and yes. go to the United States or somewhere else. Mm-hmm. So what is it? So if I, if you had a heart attack or let's say you need a maybe a hip replacement's a better example, yeah. an elective sort of procedure, but yeah. you probably need it within a year because yeah. you're pain. So how does that process work either through the NHS or then if you want to try and bypass that and go through private yep. means expenses, those sorts of things? Sure. Um, okay. So, uh, yes, you can, you can go to your doctor. You get put on a waiting list for a hip replacement. The, the waiting time will vary around the country. Uh, the waiting list for things like hip replacements are not nearly as long as they, as they used to be. Uh, or if you're privately insured, you can... Um, you still have to start with your GP, he, but he will then refer you to uh, a consultant in private practice who, who's probably working for the NHS as well as in private practice. Sure, okay. And then you'll have the surgery through, your, um, through the private hospital. The advantages of the private insurance are, um, are partly that you're just treated in a better way. If you like, the hospital aspects, uh, sorry, the hotel aspects of care <laughs> uh-huh. uh, are, are rather better. The, um, the the hospitals are of a more humane size uh, and that type of thing. And you'll be treated when you want to be treated rather than when the system wants you to be treated. Sure. Uh, um, but it will, of course, uh, uh, cost you. I just happen to have private insurance through one of my jobs uh, and it's, it's, it's not especially cheap. So I'm paying <laughs> twice for healthcare, once through taxes, right. once through private insurance. You can pay... And this is probably in the long run cheaper for most people than taking out private insurance. You, you can pay, pay for procedures as you need them. Episodic yeah. care, yeah. yeah. So I think one of the reasons why people tend to take out private insurance rather than pay for treatment uh, as they need it is because they might be concerned about really, really long-term expensive treatments such as uh, cancer treatments and that type of thing. Sure. What percentage of people in, in England have private insurance? Um, I'm not actually sure. I think it's a... I think about seven or eight percent of all healthcare is undertaken privately. It's something of that order, but I think there are a much larger proportion of the population that have um, uh, uh, policies which uh, um, pay pay them cash when they have a healthcare need, okay. and they can either use that cash to um, uh, for private provision, or they can keep the cash and and, and um, have a NHS uh, provision as as well. Okay. So there are various ways in which people can insure themselves against healthcare, and I'm not sure how the numbers exactly stack up. But the total private provision is pretty small. Pretty small yeah. part of the market. And what is there any idea, sir, how often people feel the need to leave the country to get their care? I mean, Mick Jagger is sort of the most recent celebrity yeah, who sure. came to the United States to get a valve replacement yeah. or something like that. Sure. Um, not many people would leave the country in, in the UK to get care. There was an initiative actually under the last Labour government to give people the right to leave the country to, to get care paid for by the state oh. if the waiting lists were over a certain length. Oh, okay. uh, that, um, not sure whether that uh, right still exists, uh, but there are not that many people who leave the country to, to get care um, because you can, you can pay privately in the UK in, in any case. I think there is a question uh, as technology develops as to... Um, whether or not uh, uh, technology really will transcend um, treatment as it's uh, offered through the NHS and make the NHS look really antiquated. So, for example, why do I need to attend a GP appointment rather than have a GP appointment by Skype? Why does that GP has to be, have to be in my village rather than allowing me to go to work and, uh, and, and Skype the GP, or indeed Skype a GP in India, um, where right. the employment of GPs might be uh, somewhat cheaper. And I gather also that there are, um, in the pipeline, much cheaper ways of doing um, uh, surgery on a much more rapid um, uh, scale than is, is currently done. And uh, there, there may be other countries, such as India, where, where this is more feasible than it is in the UK. Sure. I mean, you're seeing medical tourism as uh, yeah. a bigger option for even people in this country who are yeah, sure. either yes. heading out of the country or they're heading to different states or different locations. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar. We have a surgery center in Oklahoma that has all the prices listed online. Yeah, and so okay. you actually can just uh-huh. pick, I need me re- knee replaced. It's going to be exactly this much. And and not only, and what's interesting as a, as a market sort of option, it has created a... Uh, an environment where not only do people they can certainly have the option to fly mm-hmm. to Oklahoma City and having the surgery done much less than they would pay for their, wherever they mm-hmm. live but they can take that price and go to their local hospital and say yeah. I can get it for this price and mm-hmm. so it has set some sort of market I guess uh, which where there was not any price transparency or there's no sure. discovery yes. process yeah. before yes. yeah no and I think that's one um, uh, what, one of the ways in which the US can learn from other systems is that um, if at least at the margin you have less insurance 
and more direct payment, co-payments and so on. Um, this leads to, uh, well, first of, first of all, cheaper services for those who choose to pay directly. And, and secondly, it creates greater tr price transparency, which makes it easier for uh, insurers to clamp down on um, abuses and overpricing elsewhere uh, in the system. So, I mean, one of the problems with the U.S. system is that it's so expensive. I think you spend, the state spends as much in the U.S. as the state spends in the U.K. on health care. Right. And um, uh, private individuals spend the, about On top the of that, yeah, yeah, right. Um, <clears throat> and um, one of the reasons for that is because insurance is... First of all, because uh, insurance covers almost everything, and secondly, because of the way in which uh, insurance is so much linked to, normally linked to employment as well. Right. Yeah. No. I. I yeah. I think uh, I've talked to many docs who are sort of working around this now. They're they're finding innovative ways to bypass the system mm. in in options that used to be. Uh, prohibitively expensive, like you would, they charge fifty dollars. Like there's direct primary care, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but they're now GPs who go out and they have their their practices entirely without mm -hmm. insurance. Yeah. This is a membership based, and it's fifty dollars yeah. a month sure. per person. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. for that, they make their income is about the same, mm -hmm. but they don't have to deal with any of the the back office infrastructure yeah, sure. and yes. overhead. And yeah, so. Yeah. It provides oftentimes better care because you sure. have better access, and they have yeah. less patients they have to take care of. And, yeah. and uh, yeah. I don't know if that sort of thing is something that's going on in England or. Well, you, yes, you can you can um, uh, get treatment by direct payment in, in England, and 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 the other thing as well is it's not just the back office of, of the insurance company, but the the costs of the insurance company monitoring. The, oh sure, uh, 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 the measures monitoring the right. doctors and, and all mm -hmm. the rest of it to make sure they're not overcharging, and the difficulty of the insurance company stopping doctors from. Uh, charging higher prices to insured payments than uh, insured um, uh, customers than, than to other uh, customers. Right, that's one of the reasons why costs rise in insured systems. Sure, and and you know I'm sure your system's similar to ours in that the insurance companies and the government try and find ways to make efficiently pay, and they end up char basically paying everyone the same amount, whether you're good or bad. Yes, and so there's there's yeah. no right. It's not in any other industry would you find like you pay all painters exactly the same sure. to paint your room, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the questions that people have. I should, I should oh, talk, go I, ahead. I yeah, I don't know that much about the details of Obamacare, but one one of the uh, things which struck me about Obamacare sort of arose from the debates about the religious and ethical aspects that uh, mm -hmm. uh, companies were forced to insure their staff for uh, abortions, so-called reproductive health, and this type of thing. And to me, these are things which should simply not be um, not be insured risks. They don't need to be insured risks. And there's just, in the U.S., far too much under the umbrella of insurance when there should be more um, more paid for by co-payments uh, so that the insurer paying something and the, uh, and, and the individual paying something themselves and you know, certain forms of treatment just out of the insurance umbrella uh, and provision out of the insurance umbrella uh, altogether. Absolutely. I mean, I think the fact that there's a third-party payment system in general distorts any yeah. sort of market discovery pro process, mm -hmm. any ability to sort of g control costs. I mean, yes. you probably couldn't design a more expensive system than the one we have. I mean, well, nobody has yet. Yes. I mean, <laughs> you, it just gets more expensive, and, and yeah. every sort of check you'd have on a system to control us is missing. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. uh, one of the, obviously, one of the big, huge expenses in the United States is pharmaceuticals. Uh, I think part of this is because we are not allowed to, to acquire pharmaceuticals from outside, other, from outside the country, and mm -hmm. so we, re, we have a closed market. You can get a couple months' supply from another country, but yeah. essentially, you are stuck getting everything mm -hmm. from this country. So I know there are countries that have uh, price ceilings on medications, mm -hmm. and so that and the pharmaceuticals oftentimes still honor those because they can, I think, make up the difference in the United States. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And is, is that the case in the EU or the UK? Yeah. So in the UK, there are long-standing controversies um, because, of course, the NHS is a single buyer of drugs, in effect, um, or, or agencies on behalf of the NHS, and the pharmaceuticals are often a single seller of uh, particular drugs. Uh, especially those which are not out of patent, and and so there's a that that's just a recipe for conflict. <laughs> yeah, right. and, and in a sense, that's unavoidable conflict. But at least if you have a range of buyers um, and one seller, that's mm -hmm. a slightly different uh, and slightly better situation. And of course, when drugs are out of patent, or when there are drugs which can do a similar job, um, uh, even if they're patented drugs, then you should allow them the, no, the maximum number of sources of supply into the market, assuming that. Um, uh, public safety is upheld. And uh, do you find with the generics, we've had a, a real problem here. I know it's a problem in the UK as well, mm. but with a, a lack of generic opportunities to, to buy generic drugs, or there's a, there are very many producers of generics because of regulatory reasons, because mm. of 
Also, there's a reason I talk about episode five. We go into the um, the pharmacy benefit managers and group purchasing organizations that yeah. basically price small manufacturers out of the market. Mm-hmm. Is is there a lot of production of pharmaceuticals in the UK, and is it is that a problem getting generics? Well, there's a, there is a significant pharmaceutical industry in the UK, and there, there is widespread production of, of generics. I'm not sure exactly whether the problems in the US are replicated in the UK, but many drugs they go out of patent, and then generics are um, uh, are produced. Uh, we we do have this similar kind of health and safety regulations, um, which actually are applied across the EU. Okay. Rather than in the UK specifically, although that will change with Brexit, uh, as as the US, uh, I, there is a demand in the UK from some quarters to allow more experimentation in terms of pharmaceuticals to allow patients to sort of wave away their rights sure. um, and and uh, take drugs which might not have been approved and and risk the uh, possibility that some something might go wrong, and and perhaps that would lead to a lowering of the cost of of drugs. Um, but we do have similar problems because, of course, a patent guarantees a monopoly, in effect, to uh, a, a company. And then in the U- UK, we have the additional problem uh, of having um, a single buyer, so a single buyer negotiating <laughs> with, a, with a, a single seller. Uh, and that single buyer is, is then able to, uh, actually able to push down the price of drugs perhaps more effectively than uh, happens in, in the US because right. the NHS can just say no. Uh, but I think it, this does raise questions for those of us who believe in uh, free markets about the uh, um, people who believe in free markets. They talk a little bit about issues to do with intellectual property patents and uh, copyright. There are lots of great um, uh, lawyers like Rich, uh, law and economics people like Richard Epstein who uh, yeah. uh, t- talk about these things. Uh, but I think, I think we need to uh, address this debate to a greater extent, and uh, especially in the pharmaceuticals industry. Now, we might think about it and actually come to the conclusion that the current patent system uh, is okay, but the current patent system is a reason why drugs are so expensive, and, uh, I, I, and it is the state effectively guaranteeing a, a monopoly as a reward for somebody making a new discovery and to prevent somebody, if you like, stealing that new intellectual right. property, and there are plenty of debates to be had about exactly how that patent law, how, how, uh, how much patent protection, if any, um, the producer of um, new intellectual property, including drugs, should get. Is the, uh, I don't know how familiar with this country, and I, I can, is uh, the patent length about the same as it is in the U.S.? I don't uh, know. No. Yeah, I mean, well, is it, because usually by the time a mar- uh, drug hits the market in the United, United States, I think the patent's like 20 years or so, but by the time it actually hits the market, they've got about eight, nine years yeah, to, to okay. make up your mm-hmm. sort of difference because the testing period is so long. Yes. And yeah. so, which naturally drives up the price, the cost, because you have mm-hmm. to make up all your money in yeah. half as much time as no, you sure. ordinarily would. Yeah. Uh, one of the one of my guests said one of the problems is with is our, with our Federal Drug Administration, FDA, where they, you have to actually prove efficacy, the, effect, the effectiveness of mm-hmm. medication, not just its safety. Yes. If you just had the safety and said, mm-hmm. these are studies we say it's going to lower your blood pressure, then you let the market or you sort of let experimentation in somewhat in the public, yeah. then it would, you could lengthen the, the time for sure. the patent, and yeah. that would, in many ways, mm. help as with, from prices. Um, Absolutely, and you might just get more competition uh, in, in, in drugs provision more generally. And, and certainly if you, if you have a system, as you do in the U.S., with a large number of uh, competing insurers, uh, no insurer is going to want to waste money on drugs which, which are uh, not effective. So it's not obvious why the law is preventing insurance companies from taking those decisions themselves. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, there are many people make the argument, as you mentioned, that if we just had one buyer like mm-hmm. the, the federal government buying all the medication for, uh, you know, it would drive down the cost, but also drives drugs that may be beneficial to some people, maybe not to majority, and they no longer have opportunity to access that drug, right? That's a potential problem with that uh, sort of system. Y- yes, because if you, if you drive down the price that's paid, you're um, lowering the return on investment. Uh, the, the companies, pharmaceutical companies have to make huge investments in research and development before they bring a product to market. Very few um, products actually the, the, where the product development process starts actually come to market and sh- sure if you if you there's a trade definitely a trade-off if you drive down the price you're, you're likely to get less innovation and fewer new drugs where do you think the NHS is moving uh, or the I should say the whole British healthcare system is it are people moving towards more insurance space are they 
Is the yeah. EU, how much is that affecting, you know, the Brexit, if that yeah. actually happens? Because I still feel like it's not, but I'm yeah. totally yes. ignorant to that up sure. in the States. Yeah. There were more people asking questions about the NHS than there were 20 years ago, but that's not saying very much, because 20 <laughs> years ago, nobody was really asking questions <laughs> about the NHS. Um, and uh, there is still a great, uh, maybe affection is the wrong word, but there's still a, a widespread belief that the NHS is better than uh, alternatives, largely because the alternative that's normally posed is, is the US system. Um, and the caricature of the US system is that everybody's dying on the streets yeah, unless sure. you've got a credit card and all the Cowboys, rest of it. Cowboys, yeah, the yeah. whole thing, yeah. Uh, and I, uh, it's probably stretching it to argue, but I think there are possibly more people now working within the NHS which understands its short, understand its shortcomings than used to be the case. Um, the question, I suppose, is how we actually... Uh, what are the political moves which will lead to the liberalization that's right. necessary? And so far, every conservative minister um, who has become health minister, despite what they've said before they've become a minister, have become huge advocates for the NHS right. after they've been, become a minister. And as far as they're concerned, the only problem is a lack of spending. The, the biggest reforms to the NHS actually came under the Blair government and sometimes it can be easier for right. a government of the left to, to uh, pursue these reforms. No, it was governments of the left actually which pursued um, a huge range of free market reforms in New Zealand, Australia, Scandinavia and so on uh -huh. uh, and, and perhaps um, it's easier for uh, a left-leaning government to reform something like the NHS than it is for a conservative government. Uh, but uh, um, the Labour Party has moved so far to the left I don't see that happening under the current leadership. Uh, um, but no, there are certainly a number number of people in the Conservative Party who really actually do see the problems with, with the NHS. This You probably can't answer this question, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, I feel like a lot of the problems can be fixed by through innovative and disruptive techniques or technologies yeah. or whatever. Is your impression of physicians in, in Great Britain, are they ones, are they, are they ones who would be interested? Are the ones who are interested in this sort of thing? Do you think are, are delivering medicine in a different way? Yeah. And mm -hmm. yes, and indeed, I, I, uh, perhaps it will. Perhaps it will be technology which leads to f uh, forms of healthcare provision which will transcend the NHS and also bring them, uh, bring cheap healthcare provision within the pockets of many more people. So more people will be afford, able to afford to go privately, and then perhaps the NHS will look increasingly anachronistic. But I think there's a very important point here, that when the NHS was established in the 1940s, um, healthcare was about doing a relatively small number of standardised things. Right. Giving people spectacles, um, <laughs> uh, vaccinating people, fairly standard operations. There weren't, many, uh, there weren't that many effective cancer treatments around, but nevertheless people were operated on for cancer and so on. And if you nationalise a system... Um, in that situation, sure, it's likely to be more inefficient, it's likely to be less patient-friendly, uh, it's likely to have other disadvantages, but um, they're relatively minor compared with the disadvantages of nationalisation in an industry where there's radical innovation happening, because nationalised industries are incredibly bad at right. adopting the right kind of innovations. Uh, and uh, as I said at the beginning, you see that in the, um, you, you see that in the system. The, the way I approach the NHS um, today is not very different from the way my grandparents would have approached the NHS. Uh -huh. um, in fact, it's not different at all. You, you, um, uh, you go to your local uh, GP, you make an appointment, you have a 10-minute conversation with the GP, uh, he writes a note to, or she writes a note to a consultant, you go and see a consultant in the hospital. Nothing has changed. The, the NHS, uh, I, I think this is quite well known, is... Britain's, if not the world's largest owner of fax machines. Um, <laughs> that, that, that's the cutting edge technology. Uh, and um, uh, I'm sure there are many GPs who do operate very differently. GPs actually do have a, some freedom um, within the current system, uh, but uh, uh, no, nationalised industries are not good at innovating. Right. Yeah, and, and I think similar to uh, you could try and get rid of the taxi the taxi system with medallion system in most cities where you know you, yeah. you limit the amount of taxis you can go from city to city and try and change the law yeah or you can just invent uber yes right i mean yes and mm -hmm. then you can and then you can 
disrupt it so badly and provide such a value that people are like, well, clearly what we had before mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense. We're just going to sure. bypass it entirely anyway. Yep. Doesn't, and sure, yes. That, that's true. The difference with taxi medallions is that the owners of the taxi medallions have a strong interest in um, keeping the value of the taxi Absolutely. medallions high and they will protest politically against Uber and successfully in many countries. Um, in the NHS, I'm not sure that there are many vested interests uh, who benefit from the NHS. I think the employees would actually be better off if there were <laughs> a wider range of competing uh, uh, providers using more innovative uh, approaches to provision. Um, but the public, I'm afraid, uh, no, it, it is uh, the opposite of the usual problem where you get sort of public demand for something and vested yeah, interest right. stopping happening. In this case, there really is public demand for the NHS, um, which is, uh, and I, it, it's not that the employees of the NHS are, are um, campaigning to keep their uh, jobs and, 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 yeah, and yeah. so on from, from the NHS. And the political class is very much sold on the NHS because they see. Um, uh, th uh, especially in the Conservative Party, they see any even hint of slight reform as something which is going to uh, uh, be an election loser. Yeah. Well, and I think fundamentally the problem we have in this in the world is we don't have really good market examples of how healthcare is delivered. We have pockets mm -hmm. here and there yep. where markets sort of partially functioning, but there's so many other problems with it and so many restrictions that you can't say, "Well, this is." Sure. This yeah. is the great way yeah. to go. But we do. I mean, we do have some good examples. Uh, some would say that there are small examples, and they illustrate, uh, and and they have their own uh, problems, or they only work because of the circumstances uh, of of how they're used. But um, no, uh, uh, Swiss system works quite well within Europe, as does, as does the Dutch system, where you have competing social insurers. People also point to the system in Singapore, which is very cheap, where people have health savings accounts, where they save money and they use that for routine stuff, and then they have insurance uh, for the big stuff. Yeah. In other words, the, the bike accidents. Yeah. 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 So the insurable risks are split off from the more routine um, health care needs. And, and their health care costs are very s small indeed. Yeah, and I guess the, the problem is, of course, the political will, right? So Lake yeah. Wobegon problem, you think what you have is is yeah. above average, even though it's maybe not exactly what you want, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I really appreciate the discussion. Thank you so much for Pleasure. spending time. Mm -hmm. Where can people find more things about you and your organization? Um, well, on the issue of healthcare, best to look at the Institute of Economic Affairs website. And there are a number of publications we've done on, on healthcare and the NHS, comparing it with other models around the world. And the author of most of those is a guy called Christian uh, Niemitz, uh, who is uh, of German origin. And he's written uh, uh, um, some papers and, and also one quite big book on the NHS, comparing it with other systems and proposing social insurance systems. Okay. And are you in Twitter? Do you tweet? I'm not on Twitter. No. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for spending time with me. Pleasure. Today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what The Doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And share the show with your friends. Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash theparadox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com. <laughs>